as you're coming down uh, the handle of the hockey stick, right, as the pressure is increasing, you're probably picking up, um, I would say, depending on the tire construction, somewhere between one and, and uh, that's, I have to think in, uh, you're probably picking up one to three watts for every bar of pressure increase. Uh, and then as soon as you hit the break point and it turns up, uh, it, it's on average, again, depends on the faster tires have lower slopes, both sides, um, slower tires have steeper slopes. Um, but once you're into the impedance range, I mean, we've, we've seen tires that have a eight to 10 Watts per bar, um, type of increase. So, you know, it's, it, it's much better to be one bar low, of, of Breakpoint than it is to be one bar high. The Triathlon Show 235. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of That Triathlon Show, the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host, Michael, and on today's episode, I interview Josh Portner, who is the CEO of Silka. Josh, Josh has spent most of his life in the cycling industry with starting out racing professionally in Europe, then working with SIP as their technical director before becoming the CEO of Silka, where he now works. In addition to his main role at Silka, Josh also consults with uh, professional cycling teams. We discuss in today's interview uh, the ins and outs of tire pressure optimization. We go really in depth on that, and that is an absolutely fascinating topic. And you stand to gain a lot of watts if you get it right, or lose a lot of watts, perhaps, is uh, the correct way to put it, if you get it wrong. We also discuss a variety of other equipment upgrades that can make you faster on the bike. And importantly, we get into the hierarchy of getting the most watts for your money spent when it comes to making such purchases or equipment upgrades. So we'll get right into the interview after thanking our sponsors. First, we have Precision Hydration that you can find on precisionhydration.com. They make electrolyte products that you can match to how you sweat. So you can basically choose between low, medium and high sodium concentrations in the electrolyte drinks. And you can take the free online sweat test to figure out where on that range you fall in terms of your individual uh, sweat sodium losses. You can get 15% off your order with the promo code DEATTRIATHLONSHOW15 on precisionhydration.com. And big thanks to Roka. We have exciting news, as I talked about in the Q&A last week. Roka has just launched their new version of their flagship wetsuit model, the Maverick X2. This wetsuit has a redesigned core, uh, so if you think of a bicycle and how a stiffer bicycle basically allows you to get more speed, better power transfer into the bike from the pedals, that is the principle that uh, that basically Roka is trying to uh, to accomplish with the redesigned core to make full power transfer or the most effective power transfer possible in this new and updated version of the wetsuit. In addition to that power transfer, they have a new taping technique so that uh, you can get better connection from the hips to the shoulder so that your uh, hip force production moves or transfers to the shoulders and into your stroke. And finally, they have added even more buoyancy to the wetsuit than was in the previous version. So plenty of upgrades there. There are other ones as well that I haven't gone into here, but those are some of the main ones. And you can get this wetsuit for 20% off with the discount code that you can get on roca.com forward slash TTS. Now, without any further ado, here's the interview with Josh Portner. Welcome to That Triathlon Show, Josh. How are you doing today? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. Um, for the listeners that might not have heard of you, I'm, I'm imagining that a lot of listeners have, but uh, let's uh, give a brief brief background and introduction to yourself so that we have some context for this interview. Okay. Uh, so I am currently the owner of Silka, uh, the pump and tool company. Uh, Silka, I think it's somewhat known, but maybe not too widely. We, I bought the company six years ago uh, out of bankruptcy and uh, in Italy, moved it to America. And at that time, we, we formed a company to purchase Silka that we call uh, Aeromind. 
And so Aeromind also then does a lot of consulting work uh, throughout the pro peloton, pro triathlon, um, a lot of tire pressure consulting, tire choice consulting. Uh, we do a lot of mathematical modeling uh, for athletes, things like that. Um, my background before that, I was technical director at Zip Wheels for 15 years, uh, which was an amazing, amazing journey. I think we, we grew that company from like six or seven employees to uh, over 200, uh, sold it to SRAM. I worked at SRAM for a little bit, uh, got to be involved in some really fun projects there, like was kind of one of the early uh, development team people with ETAP and uh, wireless shifting and some of the things that, uh, that we all know and love from SRAM. Uh, and then before that, I spent a little bit of time in auto racing. Uh, and before that, I went to college for aerospace and mechanical engineering. And I also spent a couple of years racing uh, in Europe uh, at what at the time would have was called like Division Two. So it would have been not quite the same as like Pro Continental today. Uh, a little like maybe a little below that, but in, in the old system, it was called D two. So yeah, uh, cyclists, we, we, was, we, which, which sort of time frame was that? What what years did you race? Ooh, um, like ninety five, ninety six. All right. Okay. Uh, one uh, topic that uh, I really want to dig deep into is, uh, as you mentioned, tire pressure. Uh, so can you just get into that to talk about how important it is to get it right? And uh, then sort of how do we get it right? And what factors are impacting the optimal tire pressure in different scenarios and so on? Yeah, absolutely. So I was on this quest at Zip to uh, have a carbon wheel. For, well, I first finished Roubaix, but ultimately wanted to win Roubaix. And you know, I think by the the mid two thousands, we had, you know, we were the CSC was the first team on carbon wheels every day. We were really changing the mentality of the riders in the peloton about aero uh, in general. And I, you know, you do the math, and aero wheels at Roubaix would be a huge advantage. So I spent three years trying to develop a wheel that could finish at Roubaix. And the, the thing we learned in there was that really it's all about tire pressure. Um, you know, you can make the wheel amazingly strong, but the wrong tire pressure, you still break the wheel or you pinch flat the tire. Um, or as we found, the rider would just go terribly slow uh, at high enough pressures. And so we started doing a ton of both lab and road tire testing and really learned in that moment that nobody, nobody was testing uh, for rolling resistance. I mean, you could go mid 2000s, you could go to any tire manufacturer and they could not give you an idea of the rolling efficiency of any of their tires uh, because they weren't testing for it. Uh, nobody was marketing it. And so I got hooked up with uh, a guy, Tom Anhalt, and another guy, Robert Chung, who invented this thing called the Chung Method. And they were using the Chung Method to determine real-world rolling resistance uh, in field testing with the special mathematical model. And we began to apply that. And in that moment, we found uh, this interesting behavior where everything we'd been told forever, you know, the high pressure, low resistance, right? Higher the pressure, the lower the rolling resistance. Well, it, at a point, the road roughness is such that that curve actually kicks upward. We call that the break point uh, pressure. And all of a sudden, the increasing pressure giving you decreasing rolling resistance flips on its head and increasing pressure starts to give you increasing rolling resistance. Uh, and so this was probably 08, 2010. Um, we kept that as a huge secret, um, you know, developed some thousand dollar special pressure gauges that, uh, you know, I was, I was the guy secretly in the Fabian Cancellara's hotel room, you know, dialing his pressure to the 10th of a PSI the morning of Roubaix and, uh, and we really just kept it all a secret for a couple of years. And then once I left uh, to do Silka, enough teams, enough mechanics, enough people knew about it that we were really able to start to start spreading the word um, that higher, you know, higher pressures aren't always faster, uh, but also the methods of testing have now really widely spread. Uh, and, and it's pretty cool to see that so much of this information today is, is at least on what tires are fast, it is widely available. Uh, on the internet, and then if you come to uh, to my site silka uh, cc uh, or listen to our podcast, um, you will see we have a, an actual pressure calculator where we're trying to kind of fit algorithms to to this behavior because it's it's a tricky uh, it's a tricky behavior to model. 
Yeah, and, and if I can chime in there, I actually just found your calculator a couple of days ago when I was uh, reading a little bit more about Silka and uh, yourself. And that uh, calculator is super cool and we'll definitely link to it in the in the show notes. So highly recommend it for, uh, for okay. anybody listening to go and have a look at that. Thank you. Yeah, it's, the, the, calcu- the cool thing with the calculator, I will say, is that it, um, it, it runs a mathematical model based on... Uh, curve fits of about 4,000 real uh, field tested data points. And so, you know, in the last five or six years, if, you know, if I go to Paris-Roubaix and we test all of the Team Bora and the EF and the Skyriders to find their optimal rolling pressure for that event, um, those data points all end up in the calculator. So, you know, if you, if you uh, know, you know Peter Sagan's weight and uh, and his measured tire size, uh, you can actually run the calculator and get the exact pressure that he won Roubaix on, um, which is it's, it's kind of fun to play around with. And I, I actually use it as a sanity check as we you know we're building the models. You take about you know twenty of, that I remember on the list, and you know you can constantly run them and make sure you're always getting the right. <laughs> it's kind of a good way to check your math, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So. So, so let's talk about first, how important is it? So how much are you losing if you're either too high or potentially too low on tire pressure compared to what would be optimal? And can you also talk about how sort of that uh, optimal point, how the rate of rolling resistance changes when you're going, when you're increasing pressure to get a decreasing rolling resistance, but then when you get past it and you start to get an increasing rolling resistance with increasing pressure is the rate the same or does the rate change yeah that's an awesome question yes the the behavior here is uh is quite asymmetric and so i like to describe it as an and you as a fin will appreciate i always describe it as a hockey stick um (laughs) that if you think of a hockey stick uh and say that you know you you're holding uh you know you're holding it by the handle the, the handle sloping down, you know, say that's a 15 degree, maybe 20 degree slope to the ground. Um, so you're holding it quite low. The handle would be the rolling resistance decreasing as the pressure increases uh, from, from a low pressure. And then the neck of the stick is what we would call the break point where the behavior starts to change. And then the blade kicks up much more steeply. Uh, and that's what we call the impedance, uh, impedance loss. And the way to think uh, about these two sets of behavior that the in a in a fast rolling tire the the casing deflecting okay is the the thing that we're trying to fix when we put the pressure high you're trying to you know have less uh, casing deflection less hysteresis losses in the casing um, that's pretty darn efficient I mean even in a bad tire it's it's ninety percent efficient and in a really good tire it, it's more than ninety percent efficient um, and so while you're raising pressure to decrease rolling resistance, it's happening at a, at a relatively low rate because the thing you're optimizing is pretty efficient to begin with. And then what's happening when you hit the breakpoint pressure and you kick up on the blade of that stick is that the, t- the tire has become so hard that you are now all of those um, bumps and things that the casing would have absorbed are now transmitting up through the bike and into the rider, and you're shaking, uh, you're shaking the rider. The other thing that you're doing, if you think of it just from a purely like a, a, a wheel hitting a bump, you know, if a wheel hits a five millimeter bump, um, and that wheel is the tire is rigid, the entire system has to be lifted the five millimeters up over the bump, right, and then set down again on the other side. And and if you do the math on this, you see there's all these vectors that are, are working against the direction of travel. Um, it's terribly inefficient. If if you've ever inline skated, you felt this. Right, a, an inline skate wheel is super hard, and as long as you're on a really smooth, hard surface, you're great. And as soon as you, you know, hit a rock, <laughs> right, or you roll onto some terrible pavement, it's like you just stop. Um, that is the impedance effect uh, in here. And so, you know, impedance that that break point is driven by uh, the rider weight, the tire, the actual casing width of the tire, like the measured width, not the width printed on the sidewall. It's driven by the rider's speed uh, and it's driven by the roughness of the surface. And so it, it actually ends up becoming a pretty challenging thing to calculate um, or even have a good rule of thumb for, which is, is why for the last 
you know, five or six years of my life, they, they pay me to come to Europe and, and help them solve it on a race by race basis. Um, so, it, so from a strategic, um, tactical perspective, it, it's quite a powerful tool. Um, you asked about magnitude as you're coming down, uh, the handle of the hockey stick, right? As the pressure is increasing, you're probably picking up, um, I would say, depending on the tire construction, somewhere between one and, and, uh, it's like, I have to think in, uh, you're probably picking up one to three Watts for every bar of pressure increase. Uh, and mm -hmm. then as soon as you hit the break point and it turns up, uh, it, it's on average, again, depends on the faster tires have lower slopes, both sides, um, slower tires have steeper slopes. Um, but once you're into the impedance range, I mean, we've, we've seen tires that have a eight to 10 Watts per bar, um, uh, type of increase. So, you know, it's, it, it's much better to be one bar low of, of break point than it is to be one bar high for sure. Yeah. 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 Even, even a quarter of a bar high would be, uh, yeah. would, would potentially be significant with that amount of slope. That is incredible that it's that steep. Um, and to put some context, if when you're saying that it's one to three Watts, uh, per bar, uh, that you're, uh, below when, when you're actually decreasing resistance with increasing pressure, that means that, uh, that potentially you could, uh, it, well, I mean, it, everybody can do the math themselves, but let's say that they're, um, uh, sorry, bar, um, yeah, I was thinking PSI, uh, but let's say your, your one bar low, which would be quite a lot, but still then, or two, two bars, then you could potentially be losing six Watts and which is significant for, uh, which anybody who has been fighting to get their FTP up by five Watts will, <laughs> will acknowledge. But then on the other side of the stick, when, when you're suddenly potentially losing, up to up to 10 watts per bar that's uh that's really crazy yeah no it's and, and it's great to hear you i i still think in psi as well <laughs> i still <laughs> I, I, i've been around long enough i still think of drag in, in grams and have to mentally convert <laughs> convert but um yeah no I, I i often talk about this in terms of uh ceramic bearings um upgrades because i think that's just so much more tangible for people that, you know, five, five PSI too low, you know, about, give or take half a bar low might cost you a, um, ceramic bearing wheel set upgrade of Watts, right? Where oh, well, yeah. five PSI <laughs> too high, uh, will cost you a ceramic wheel set upgrade plus ceramic bottom bracket upgrade plus oversized ceramic pulley upgrade, uh, worth of Watts. Well, well that, that is an amazing <laughs> analogy. I, <laughs> so, I really like that. Yeah. Um, you, you said that it's very difficult to give rules of thumb, uh, but uh, maybe I can give you my results from the from the calculator that I just did a like a very sort of brief calculation. I didn't even I have to admit I didn't measure my my tire width uh, appropriately. I just found for the same tire what somebody on Slot which had measured it to be, uh, which would be I used the GP five thousand uh, tubeless uh, twenty five millimeter, but the the width of them where somebody had measured them to roughly 30 millimeters. So, mm -hmm. uh, so that's what I used. And my weight is uh, 67 kilos and I used sort of like a normal road surface setting and a speed of 40 kilometers per hour. And, uh, I found that for me, that optimal tire pressure would be 70 PSI in the front and 70 in the back in the TT position mm -hmm. when I've us usually gone with uh, with 80 in my races as, or even 82, 82 has been sort of what I've been shooting for. So uh, that just, uh, and again, if I were to like really want to optimize it, obviously I would measure my own tire before when the races start up. That's definitely something I will do. But uh, But it just gave me an indication at least that probably even though I'm not, feeling that I'm super high on entire pressure, I've probably still been too high. Yeah. I'll say the, you know, the thing that's really changed or one of the things that's really changed these last few years is, is how, how wide the rims have really gotten. Um, you know, I'm still surprised at it and I do this every day, but yes, that, you know, your 25 millimeter tire might caliper at 30. That's a huge difference from the tires perspective. Um, and, and your weight perspective. And so, yeah, I would say in, in general, probably 90% of the people I, I talk to and work with outside of pro racing, uh, are, are running too much, uh, too much pressure. Uh, and I say outside of pro racing because inside of pro racing, I think, uh, 
a hundred percent of them are running too much pressure. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and I think a lot of it is just, it's, it's the mechanics are old school, right. And, and they've, you know, they've had a career of more is better. Um, and so that's, it's a real, it's a real challenge to get some of those pressures to come down. But when, when it does, the, the results are magical. So no, I'm, I'll be interested yeah. to hear your, your comments on your 70 PSI. Yeah, so, yeah, that will be interesting to test. Uh, can we give one more example? What what are you riding when you're riding? And they give some uh, data points for your tires and your weight and so on. Oh goodness! Uh, so the dirty secret of uh, what I do is that you almost never ride. <laughs> so <laughs> I say if you if you ever want to stop riding, uh, get a job in the industry <laughs> or, yeah. or start a company. Um, I you know I have to say I have a set of these. Well. We, we have a million sets of tires that we test. Uh, personally, I have a set of very special Vittoria um, tires that were they made last year. Uh, all the teams got a couple sets of them. They're, they were essentially prototypes of the the 2.0 courses uh, with the G Plus and all that other stuff. They are the fastest tires I've ever tested, ever ridden. Um, I put them on some 303s. They caliper out to be right around 29 29 and a half, somewhere in that range. Um, and I am 180 pounds, uh, which I hate to say, I think I, my race weight was like 150. So <laughs> it's part of getting old and not riding. Um, but 180 pounds on a, a, you know, probably a 20 pound steel bike. Uh, and I run those tires like 62, 64, maybe 62, 65, somewhere in that range. Um, for the pavement we have here in, in uh, Indianapolis, which is pretty, it's pretty crappy pavement. Uh, so that, that makes for a, a nice rolling tire. Yeah. Low That's actually, actually one thing that I wanted to get into the different sort of categorizations of pavement you have. I don't remember exactly what they're called in your calculator, uh, but it's something that comes up as well in tools like Best Bike Split, uh, where you have to choose between, well, are you going to ride on like really smooth pavement or is it sort of, normal or is it bad pavement those are like the general gists i guess of, of the different mm-hmm. categories that you right. tend to choose from as a triathlete anyway um how do you know which one is which and uh i i guess generally most would be probably normal but do, how, how normal is for example very smooth pavement something that should be categorized yeah. as the best category yeah no uh, you you just hit on i mean this was the thing that that honestly pushed the calculator back probably a year from when i would have liked to have uh, launched it and and it's still I would say it's still highly incomplete in this regard uh, for a couple of reasons the the big one is so we there's a, a tool called a profilometer that we can use on pavement to determine essentially what you want to look at is the maximum uh, what you'd call the RZ value and it's essentially think of it as you know at the if you were to cross section the pavement and look at it sideways what's the the distance between the peaks and the valleys of the bumps? Um, and then kind of how many bumps, you know, per unit of length, right. I've got so many bumps per inch or per meter or whatever that looks like. Um, and and so this is honestly why I, you know, I think last year I did 200,000 frequent flyer miles or something, uh, traveling, you know, this is still why we, we go to these races, um, is to really get a handle on what these pavements are, uh, and then try to work into the calculator from that. Now, of course, for the average user who doesn't have all these tools, um, we just have to try to, this is where the rule of thumb comes in. You know, if your pavement sort of looks like this picture, call it this. Uh, but yeah, I, I think in the next, my goal in the next few months is we will probably at least double the amount of pavement types, um, and descriptions and add additional information for, for people to be able to, uh, try to more accurately pick, uh, pick the type of surface that they're on here in Indiana is a great example. You know, we, uh, we have a thing they call chip and seal where, you know, they, these great country roads, they'll essentially spray, uh, like a liquid, you know, some sort of petroleum product, and then essentially just pour like a gravel over it and, and let it be. And it, it, it's fine for the farmers and the trucks. Um, but it's, it's wickedly slow. I mean, you, you see this in your power meter. I mean, you'll, you know, you'll hit this stuff and all of a sudden it might take another 60 Watts to go the same speed. Um, and as the pressure comes down on those surfaces, you see the speed start to come back. Um, 
but that's a hard surface to define, right? I mean, we would technically define it by the average size of the uh, of the stone <laughs> that they've mm-hmm. that they've stuck down. In the same way that you would uh, define a sandpaper, right? You say, "Oh, that's a hundred grit." Well, you know, we might say that's a um, you know a, a quarter inch or, or, or a one centimeter um, stone size, and then that would feed into the calculator. But yeah, the, these are tough. The, the other one that's really hard uh, that you don't always think of is that on smooth surfaces, a lot of the rolling resistance is driven by the negative space in the pavement, uh, the pores. And so, you know, when they make uh, a pavement, that top layer, they have the, the option of choosing different sizes of the stone in the aggregate. And one of the things you learn uh, about paving is that the smaller the stone, the tighter the aggregate, the more expensive it is. Um, and so depending on where you are, you know, some places may pave with coarser stones, um, which means you've got bigger uh, pores, bigger negative spaces, uh, and other places might, might pave with them tighter. And so you know, I have seen pavements, brand new pavements that look identical, and when we really get down at them and take like a surface map or a pressure map, um, you might find that the one has two to three times the porosity uh, and the average porosity size is larger. And so what if you think of it from the perspective of the contact patch of the tire, you know, if my contact patch is, say, a, a kind of a long, beautiful oval uh, shape, and, you know, let's just, for easy math, we're going to say, you know, I've got 100 pounds at 100 PSI, so, you know, I need one inch, okay, of contact patch. Well, if I take my beautiful one-inch area oval contact patch and I start putting holes in that, well, now that contact patch has to grow, right, to make, to, to make an equivalent patch. Um, and this is one of the, the real advantages of, of the wider tires uh, that we see is that the wider tire has a lower tangency angle where the casing is, is hitting the road. And so if you roll over a hole and you need to recruit additional tire casing um, in that moment to make your contact patch, uh, you can do it much more efficiently because it's naturally already closer to the ground. Um, but th- this is a hard one to see in a lot of pavements. You, know, you might look at, say, pavement A and pavement B, and they were just laid down a week ago and just rolled, and, and they both look perfect. But one might have a breakpoint pressure that's, um, you know, five or six psi uh, lower than the other because of these negative pores. Um, you know, that that one oftentimes will also be faster with a wider tire than you might have been able to get away with on. Uh, the, the much smoother pavement. So, yeah, it's it, it's a it's a wickedly complex. Uh, I'd say almost more of an art form at this point uh, than a science, and that's that's really our goal is to kind of find this point of merger between the art and the science, so we can sort of share this knowledge with everybody. So, I guess maybe as a practical tip, if you're not sure which category your pavement would uh, belong to, maybe you you see what your optimal pressure would be with both the ones that you're debating between and you either pick the lower one of them uh, just to be on the safe side or perhaps you go with a compromise in between in between the two yeah absolutely absolutely I, same thing for events you think of uh you know how we we strategize pressures around a lot of like, like a pro tour race um you know it, it makes sense to look at the whole course and say well it, you know uh, something like Roubaix, are we going to optimize? I mean, uh, I guess I'll give you this example of how complicated it can be. So at Roubaix, the thought had always kind of been, do we optimize for the cobbles or do we optimize for the pavement? And then there's multiple different pavements. Uh, so, and, and then, of course, it, the finished sprint is in a velodrome. And so, you know, if it comes down to the sprint you and you optimize for that, your pressures will be quite a bit higher. Um and what we've really learned over the years of the 10, 11 years I've been doing Group A um, is that where the break goes and where the the moves happen, where the efficiency is the most important, is almost always dependent on the wind, which way the wind is blowing from. Um, and so we know when the wind, you know, like if the wind is from the north, then all of the cobbled sections pretty much run north-south. And if the wind is strong from the north, it's almost impossible to get away uh, on the cobbles as a in any sort of a break, even a, a reasonable sized one. Uh, and so that tells us that the move, when it happens, will almost certainly happen on the pavement, um, where there's there's a 
It's mostly a north north south course with this sort of jutting out that goes west and then comes back to the east, and that's where like the famous twenty ten cancel R move goes in this zone. Um, and, and so it's it's down to that. You know, we might run uh, you know a tenth of a bar or one point one five bar higher uh, in a year where the the wind is out of that direction than say we would we would run if there was a, a wind out of the west um, because that that can change the complexion of the race. So you know, similarly, if you've got uh, you know, race like Tour of Flanders, where you have cobbles, but they're much more mild. Um, you know, we we try to take that decision based, uh, oftentimes again, based on the wind and based on where a specific rider thinks they may be able to make that break. Because you think of, you know, if you're if you're making that break on a flat, um, and, and you're trying to hold that gap, that one or two watts is cr- is so much more critical in that moment uh, than that one or two watts is going to be the rest of the race, where maybe you're at eighty or eighty five percent. Right. Um, versus if you're, you know, going on the, the Koppenberg or something. Um, and, you, you know, if you're using a climb to establish a gap, and particularly if it's a cobbled climb, then, you know, all of our eggs go in on that cobbled climb basket that, you know, I can probably, with a perfect pressure, I can probably buy a rider four to six watts um, on a climb like that. And that, that could be enough to, to just establish enough of a gap that, that it won't be closed. Yeah, and especially if the other riders are not at the optimal uh, point, they, it might be even bigger potentially. Like you're not only getting the most for your rider, but the other ones might be might be losing out a bit. So then suddenly you have a relatively bigger gap. Uh, oh, that's uh, sure. su- su- yeah. super fascinating how how the race complexity plays into into the optimization. Um, I, just one more question on this topic, and I think that uh, then we'll leave it at that and uh, let the listeners go and have a look with the calculator and play around with it. But can you just run down the list of uh, factors that impact on optimal tire pressure and in which direction uh, it affects how you should set your tire pressure? So, for example, higher weight means that tire pressure should be higher and so on, just so that yeah. uh, everybody sort of gets the basic idea. Oh, sure. Yeah, so uh, weight is the start. Um, you know, our, we use the, the system weight, right? So it's rider plus bike plus clothing plus water bottles plus whatever's on the bike. Um, and yes, higher, higher weight, higher mass, uh, systems need more pressure. Um, you need a higher spring rate essentially because you have more mass, uh, on top of that tire. You know, it's, I would say that the, the easiest way to really think of, of all this is that your, your tire is like a little miniature suspension. Um, and you think of like tuning a suspension fork or a shock on a mountain bike, the, the air pressure is what's controlling the spring rate, uh, and the tire construction is what's controlling the damping. And the, the difference in a, a tire system like this is that with so little deflection, you want no damping. I mean, you know, ideal system has as little damping as possible um, for efficiency purposes. So, so higher weight, uh, you need a, a higher pressure for a higher spring rate. Um, the next big one is the tire size. And this is where the, we talked earlier about the measured tire size uh, is what's critical. The, the tire, the air pressure works on the casing uh, in a way. We, we call it casing tension. Uh, and there's a bunch of really cool math behind it, but essentially, um, you know, the, the larger the diameter of the tire, the higher the spring rate for a given pressure. And one of the things with the modern clinchers and some of these tubeless, uh, wide tubeless rims is that, you know, a tire might say 25 on the sidewall, but might actually measure 30 uh, on the rim. Well, from a, a spring rate, uh, perspective that tire is behaving more like a 30 than it is like a 25. And so that's why it's super critical to measure the tire. Uh, and this one goes in the direction of the bigger the tire, the lower the pressure, uh, and the smaller the tire, uh, the higher the pressure. Um, so if you hop in our calculator and, and poke around, it's fun. You know, if you, you put in a 20 millimeter tire, you realize that the pressure we were running uh, back in the 90s isn't isn't crazy. <laughs> <laughs> with a with a tire that measures 20 you really do need 120 130 psi um but by the time that tire gets to say 30 yeah you're you're probably in the, the 70s 80s heck maybe 60s um so you've got uh road surface condition uh the rougher the road the softer the tire uh and vice versa the the smoother the road uh the higher the pressure uh, before you hit that break point, um, we get into, oh gosh, I'm not looking at the calculator at the moment. We get rider speed. 
uh, you know, the faster the rider, the higher that pressure tends uh, to need to be. And this is partly due to the hysteresis um, of the casing uh, of, of the tire. It, it, rider speed sort of shifts the brake point slightly, not, not by a huge amount, but what, what rider speed really affects uh, is the impact energy at which you hit things. And so faster riders hit the same bump uh, w- with exponentially more energy. Uh, there's a velocity squared in the math there that uh, makes it much easier to pinch flat. And so faster riders uh, tend to need a little bit higher pressure. Um, and then you've got wheel diameter uh, and tire diameter, and that affects something known as the approach angle, uh, which is the same as we talked about with the tangency angle of the casing earlier. The, the larger the diameter of the uh, essentially the tire where it meets the road, the easier it is for it to recruit casing. Um, and And actually the in that case, it can actually run slightly, um, uh, slightly higher pressures, uh, and then with lower uh, tangency angles, it obviously goes the other way. Uh, and then you've got uh, oh god, what's our last parameter? Are you looking at it? <laughs> uh, not actually, but uh, let me pull it up pull it up here because I obviously say it in my uh, favorites immediately, so I have it handy. It will be open in a minute. Uh, oh, we had tire width, surface condition, wheel diameter, average speed, weight distribution. Oh, weight distribution. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, weight distribution. And that is just, you know, you're, because the tire is acting as a spring, how much weight is on each part of the bike. Uh, th- this is one that's the, the calculation here is quite proprietary to us. I would say most calculators historically uh, and, and tire charts have always adjusted pressure proportional to weight change. And what I found over the years is, is that uh, this tends to give you too low of a pressure for any sort of aggressive cornering uh, or descending. And so a lot of the, the, like the Yarno beer, uh, not Yarno Beerman. Um, oh gosh, I'm the, the 15% tire drop. I'm just blank on the name at the moment. Uh, Yarno's the bicycle rolling resistance guy, but the, uh, uh, oh God, Yep, totally blank. Uh, the, I can't help you. Sorry. The 15 per- <laughs> yeah, the fifteen percent drop uh, chart that has been around forever. Jan Heine is a big proponent of it, and what we find there is that you know if 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 you're say your weight is forty sixty, um, that might be perfect for you riding on the tops or the hoods on a flat road. But when the road turns down, uh, there's a natural weight shift to the front wheel, and then if the rider gets into an aggressive tuck, there's even more of a weight shift onto the front wheel. And all of a sudden, you're running a, a front tire that can be underinflated by, you know, five ten percent. Um, and so our formula really tries to take into account uh, that weight shift during descending, uh, to just just to make sure that you don't find yourself in a spot where, you know, suddenly the front tire is really squirmy um, or really imprecise in its handling. Um, and and what you find is that when you actually dial it back uh, and, and run the optimization around it. You know, you may technically be a couple psi higher than you should be um, for the optimal optimal, but it's totally worth it um, from a safety handling uh, rider confidence perspective. So, and then yeah, that makes sense. And then, not in the calculator today. You know, there are a lot of other factors that we we do run. Uh, the big ones that'll probably make it into the calculator someday: uh, temperature, uh, and particularly temperature gradient um, through a time period is is a huge one that we optimize for, for a lot of events. Uh, Again, I'll pick on Roubaix, you know, like like Roubaix last year, um, you know, we started pretty cold. I think it was like one or two degrees Celsius uh, that morning. And we knew that by the time we hit the Arenberg forest, it was supposed to be, you know, I think like 14 Celsius or something. Um, And so, you know, when you inflate a tire, just cold sitting there to a pressure, and then the rider goes to ride at the friction uh, from the casing will typically raise that pressure between half and one psi, um, and then about for every ten uh, ten degrees Fahrenheit, um, we see about a one psi rise in that tire pressure uh, with the day. And so you can actually uh, kind of run the calculations back, you know, where we say, okay, the 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 key point in today's event is going to come in four hours, where the temperature is going to be this. Uh, and so we need to offset or, or compensate for those effects uh, when we're doing the inflation first thing in the morning uh, here. And so te- temperature is really probably the last piece of that puzzle that, that has much yeah. of a factor that anybody would notice. 
All right, great. So as I said, we'll link to the calculator and uh, highly recommend it for all listeners to go and have a look. Now I want to go into some uh, just quick and dirty topics on a number of different pieces of equipment. And uh, uh, one thing that we uh, we should mention is that you, well, you have your podcast, it's called the Marginal Gains Podcast. And some of these equipment choices are definitely not marginal, but uh, basically the premise of the podcast is to talk about things that can make you faster, whether they are marginal or uh, incremental or exponential. So, uh, so I think that you are a great person to to give a comment on on these different pieces. And uh, so, let's start with bike frame. How important is that, and uh, what uh, what should you sort of think about when it comes to the bike frame? Ooh. Uh, frame is important, uh, not as important as most other things. Uh, I, I would say you want to be arrow. Uh, and you really want, I, I'd say the hardest part of the modern bike is, is getting a high quality frame that's straight, <laughs> that is reasonably easy to, uh, to, to maintain. Uh, that's, I would say for, for everybody outside the pro tour, I see so many more athletes on the side of the road with mechanicals, with, um, maintenance issues, you know, things like that, uh, than I would say anybody uh, outside of, of, you know, people going as fast as pro tour athletes go, um, you know, maybe really needing that last, that last inch of cable housing to be hidden, <laughs> something like that. Um, you know, I, I think people put way too much emphasis on weight. Uh, I, I tend not to think about it even at the pro level. I mean, we think about it sometimes in some situations, but rarely. Um, so yeah, frame, I would say it's, you know, in the hierarchy, it's probably fourth or fifth um, place in terms of, of aerodynamic importance. Um, but you can get a pretty darn good uh, aero frame for a pretty darn good price. And if you make good choices with it, you know, you can be within a few percent of the, the top. And then, you know, if you're truly like crazy um, or, you know, you're, you're fighting for those fractions of a second in your event, um, then then yes, it, it absolutely pays to go all the way to the to the extreme extreme. But th there are there are very real costs to the extreme. <laughs> yeah, great. Let, let's go down your list of the the top four then of uh, the internal aerodynamics that you mentioned. What would be number one? Oh, so number one uh, position, uh, which I guess plays in some ways into frame. Uh, mm. You know, right, rider position is where you find uh, probably. 60, 70, 80% um, of gains. And so, you know, you, I guess the, the problem is these, these things are additive. So, you know, you put a, a somebody with a really, a really great fit on a slow bike. Um, they probably aren't going to beat somebody with a 90% fit on a really fast bike. Right. <laughs> but, but um, you know, I generally go at it with the assumption that, we can probably put most anybody in most any position um, on most any bike. And that's not a hundred percent true, but uh, position is critical. And I've never seen an, well, actually I've seen two athletes in my life that I couldn't make any faster in um, with position. And because they were both just so naturally slippery. And that was uh, uh, Vyacheslav Ekimov and uh, Santiago Botero. Those two guys, I mean, you could, you could lower them two centimeters and you get the same CDA value. <laughs> it's just crazy. I've never seen anything like it. Every other athlete I've ever worked with, um, I could probably find you, uh, you know, at least, a, I don't know, a 0 0.005 CDA improvement in 30 minutes um, of position. And, that, and that's the kind of stuff that's going to be, you know, you, you have to spend a lot of money to start finding some of these gains with, uh, you know, a single piece of equipment. So I'd go position, um, helmet is absolutely huge. Uh, the dirty secret with the helmet, uh, is that your body, uh, and particularly your, your hand, both your hand position, your shoulder position, and the curvature of your back, um, will control how well the helmet works. And so because of that, it's pretty hard to make a rule of thumb. You know, people will say, this is the fastest helmet. And you're like, well, yeah, maybe on that person in that position. Um, but, you know, I've seen helmets that were uh, unbelievably fast on one rider and you put it on in the next rider and it's actually slower than, you know, the, the baseline helmet. 
Um, so helmets are huge and you really have to test it uh, for yourself. You know, what works for your favorite pro may or may not work for you. Um, you know, the wheels are huge. Uh, you know, wheels are big largely because they, they translate and rotate. And I think that's uh, one that, that gets lost or, or I think we, we tend to not think about it and, and companies tend to not market about the rotational drag because uh, it's a much harder message to, to explain. But, you know, you think of a wheel, uh, you know, a wheel makes so much drag in the wind tunnel, um, but then it also is sucking up watts in its power to spin. Um, and, and those are very non-trivial numbers. Um, you know, power to, power to spin a disc wheel is a couple of watts. Um, but power to spin, a you know, a, a spoked wheel might be six or eight Watts and then power to spin like a 32 spoke, uh, you know, the classic Paris-Roubaix wheel, right? 32 round spokes. And that, that can be 35, 40 Watts, uh, just to spin at 30 miles an hour. So, um, you know, wheels sort of have that double effect, uh, on drag. And then, you know, I got a, a clothing and, and wrinkles in clothing are just so big, um, you know, the, the fit of your clothing is, it, it depends on the person, but, uh, the fit is probably more important than the fabric and the materials and the design and all that stuff. Um, but then you can, if with a proper fitting, uh, skin suit or bodysuit, you know, with those special fabric, uh, you know, technologies, we, you can just, the drag just falls off, uh, off the person. So yeah, those, those would be my top five. And then you get into, uh, frame, you know, is, is certainly a big deal. Um, but really probably, you know, I would say slightly behind, uh, those other guys. Yeah. A couple of follow-up points first on the helmet, uh, something that I've heard thrown around and that some people do is to tape the vents of, uh, of a helmet to reduce drag. Is that something that yep. you would recommend doing? It, ooh, I'll use my favorite answer. It depends. Um, yeah, it, it tape over the vents almost always makes the helmet faster in the wind tunnel. Um, I preface that always by saying I'm not a physiologist and I'm not even all that interested in that, that, that side of, uh, of sports science. And so, you know, I would really hate for you to tape that vent over and then overheat and, and, you know, lose 20 minutes in an event because of some uh, physiological problem. Uh, and, and it happens. I mean, I, I've seen it happen more than once, um, you know, at triathlons, at, at major races. So yeah, that, that's an interesting, it depends sort of a trade-off, um, you know, is saving a couple grams of drag, uh, worth a potential overheating risk. You know, if you're, if you're in Dubai, uh, the answer is pretty clearly no. Um, you know, if you're racing, a uh, early spring, uh, time trial series in Finland, Right, it, that's probably pretty safe to go ahead and throw the tape over the fence. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, well, it's really going to depend on you. Yeah, my, my anecdotal experience because I have used this in uh, multiple races, and uh, the well, the warmest I raced in, in with the the vents taped is probably around twenty five degrees, maybe slightly lower between twenty and twenty five degrees. Because um, yeah, I've been lucky with not having had any super hot races, but in that sort of temperature, I've been just fine uh, with uh, with the vents taped. Yeah, and uh, the other to follow up, uh, the other follow up on the helmet is uh, a visor. Does that help? Totally depends. Yeah, I, I have absolutely seen that one go both ways. Um, a lot of it really seems to depend on uh, how low the head is relative to the body, and how well you can do the thing we call the turtle, right? Which is that sort of shrug that kind of lowers your head and neck. Um, if if you can turtle well, the visor tends to be quite fast. Um, and I think that's thinking from a, a, an airflow perspective, a good turtle typically gets the face down pretty close to the arms and the visor ends up pushing the air around the rider's body, um, you know, to the sides. If your head sits higher, um, on the body, then what we see a lot of times is that the visor can actually sort of dump the air down into the chest area. And you may actually go worse. Um, and, and you really just need to put a rider in the tunnel or on the track and, and test it both ways. You know, the, the other, uh, I would say, testing problem we see uh, with the wind tunnel, which is why I love field testing so much, is, you know, I can put you in the wind tunnel and make you hold a position for 30 seconds to get a data point. 
that doesn't mean you can go do that in an event. Um, and so quite often, you know, I, I've seen athletes do things in the tunnel to get a number that looks really great. And then, you know, I'll see them on the internet or in a magazine and go, no, you know, you're, you know, we, you lowered your head to put the visor on. And then when you actually race, that wasn't comfortable. So the head's up, but you still have the visor on, um, you know, and now you're actually hurting yourself. Uh, so that's the beauty of field testing is that you can make a change and then make yourself do a, you know, a, a seven, 10 minute, uh, you know, test set to see if you can actually hold that position, you know, what, what it really looks like. Um, but yeah, so visor, I, I'd call it 50, 50, uh, for yeah. my experience. Speaking of, speaking of field tests, uh, do you use, or, or how, how familiar are you with, uh, the, uh, real time arrow measurements that we now have, uh, multiple different companies producing sensors for what's your take on them? <laughs> Yeah, so uh, we I, I was the first owner of an Alpha Mantis Air Stick. I actually bought two of them when I was at Zip uh, from Alpha Mantis. And this is the one that Garmin has now bought and is trying to bring to market. Um, they're, I, they will be useful. I would say, you know, I, 10, oh God, 10, 12 years ago when we probably bought our Aero Stick, um, we could never make it work in the way that we wanted it to work, or I think in the way that they wanted it to work. Um, as a real-time CDA measurement. Uh, we found it was terribly useful um, for doing uh, Chung-style field testing. Uh, it's great to have as something to help you pull out those anomalies. So, you know, Chung testing is essentially writing uh, laps or circuits and then using this sort of mathematical, it's really the math is just so beautiful behind this, but using uh, this sort of mathematical calculation to back out uh, CRR and CDA, uh, f- from the data. And it, it's incredibly accurate. I mean, I've, I've chung for a- at least a dozen years. Um, we still use it. Pro tour teams use it. We use it at the try. I mean, it, it, it's the most widely used method. Um, actually was neck deep in chung for, uh, Olympic preparation. We, we work with a number of Olympic federations and some of the bike makers. And I would say, probably a quarter of the bikes at the Olympics would have were being developed using this method um, over like an aero probe or sensor method. But the, the sensor is really good at finding anomalies. Like um, you had a strange gust of wind or a car passed um, things like that. You can pick up in the sensor um, to help you make sense a little bit better sense out of the data. Uh, but no, I, I've actually been working with a couple of these and really struggled to use them any of them yet in the way that I think they're they're intended or, or dreamed to work. <laughs> so, you so know, it, like, right, right, right now the recommendation is to wait a bit for development to progress further before spending a lot of money on, on getting one. Yeah, I I would say that I, I think to me chung testing is a lot like uh, well, and it's how we do a lot of our rolling resistance testing. It's free. Right. I mean, it's there, there's a golden sheet. It's a free software you can download and it really just takes your time and your energy uh, to invest in it. And, you know, I see this with, with, you know, individual athletes, with pro teams, with pro triathletes, you know, I think it's so much easier for all of us to just go spend the money on the thing <laughs> than to put the time and the energy in. But this is one where my, my experience is that it is still much better to put the time and the energy in, uh, to, to run the testing yourself than it is to buy, uh, to buy the thing. You know, I, I have no doubt where the directionality is here that, you know, is it two years, three years, five years? Um, the probe sensor is going to be the, the, the future. You know, I mean, we saw this with heart rate monitors and then power meters and, um, these things are the future. I just am not seeing them, um, being quite where they need to be yet, uh, from what I've seen. Yeah, uh, to to make them really worth your while, especially when you can actually go out and get more better information uh, using stuff you already own uh, for the cost of a few hours of your time. Yeah, you know that makes sense. Um, and one other follow up question was on the wheels. So you mentioned the uh, rotational drag of uh, of the spokes, but uh, just generally in terms of total uh, drag and or just. I guess optimizing your your bike setup. If you have, if you can only buy one rear wheel and you're a triathlete you're racing non draft races, 
how much faster is a disc wheel compared to a 60 or a 90 meter uh, deep section wheel? Uh, just so that you can sort of get a sense for whether it makes sense to buy one of those deep section wheels and you're not losing a lot on most courses, but potentially when you get to a really windy race, you'll be better off compared to that disc wheel. Yeah, so the the beauty the, the beauty of the the disc wheel, or I guess the beauty of the advantage of the disc wheel is that it 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 provides a pretty subtle advantage everywhere, right? So you're maybe talking a couple watts of translation and call it another couple watts uh, of wattage to spin. Um, so I would say in most conditions it's probably a you know three to five, three to six watt advantage. But then when you get into a good crosswind, the disc, I mean, the the drag just falls off the disc, right? Because you get this sort of sailing effect. And so, you know, you can have a disc can quickly become a 20, 25 watt advantage in the right wind. Um, And part of what makes it interesting is that wind uh, where it's most advantageous is also the wind where a lot of people will choose not to ride it. (laughs) Yeah. And, and so, you know, one of the things that, that uh, I've working with a lot of pro triathletes over the years is, you know, really working with them, um, on their bike handling skills, um, to really help get them comfortable with the disc and, and help them understand too, you know, having that, all of that surface area at the rear of the bike, it moves, uh, what we call the center of pressure rearward in the bike. And so it can actually help to stabilize the handling a little bit, um, of the bike in those, those rough winds. Uh, but, but it feels different, right? It's a little bit scary at first. It's a little nerve wracking. And so you really need to work on the bike handling to get comfortable. And, um, you know, I would say, you know, Jan Frodeno is, uh, one of my favorite examples of somebody who's just put the time in to really learn it, to feel it, to become one with it. Um, and you know, he'll, he'll tell you now. And I think, you know, one of the things that we've kind of beaten into these guys over years is, you know, not think of that bad wind in that moment as like, oh crap, this wind is terrible. But think of that wind in that moment as, oh my God, this is the, this is that condition where I've got the most advantage, right? I mean, mm-hmm. there's a real psychological component of, of turning, uh, turning that perceived disadvantage or annoyance of that wind and turning it into something that makes you think, wow, this, I, I could put 10 minutes on these guys, you know, in the bike leg because I've got this wheel and they're on that wheel. Um, and so I, I think in the the right rider with the right training and and work put in, um, you know, my, my advantage at the or my advice to pros is you should ride a disc always and everywhere except at Kona, where you're not, unfortunately not allowed. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, for for the rest of us, uh, you know, the the advantage of the disc is it's present, but it's small. And, you know, I think especially if you're, um, a time strapped, uh, athlete, you know, if you're one of these people who's at a super high level, but you're doing it on, on eight hours a week or 10 hours a week, um, you probably don't have the, you know, the time to really put into like the handling side of that wheel. And in that case, it, you know, the couple Watts advantage may completely be undone, by just the, the discomfort of riding it in a, in the bad wind. Mm. Um, so that, that's sort of my advantage that, you know, you're going to get, you're going to get 80, 90% of the effect with a deep, you know, an 80, 90 millimeter deep rear, uh, that you're going to get with the disc. Um, so if you're not comfortable, if you're nervous, you know, that, that's my big thing, uh, really for all athletes, if, you know, if it's going to be in your head while you're riding, right. Anything equipment related, don't do it. Uh, cause it's, you know, the, the, the half a percent, the whatever, it, it's not worth that nagging mental, uh, you know, that loop that gets played in people's heads when, they, uh, when they're uncomfortable with something. Yeah. Um, let's talk about the things that you have on your feet, the shoes and uh, socks, uh, potentially, socks or no socks, oh, yeah. and yeah. shoe covers. Yep. Yeah. Huge. Uh, oh, huge. And I mean, I've crazy, like uh, socks. I've seen socks on some riders be like, like, three, four Watts, right? I mean, that's insane. That's, that's your, uh, your oversized ceramic pulley system. Uh, that's three, four Watts fa- faster right. with socks than without socks. Yes. Is that yeah. With, yeah. with the right, the right aero socks. Uh, hmm. yeah. The, the, you know, the true, the ribbed, uh, kind of specialty aero socks number of companies are making them. Um, yeah. Three, four Watts. That's, that, it's kind of unbelievable. And the same thing with shoes. 
um, you know, a really arrow shoe, uh, one with laces or with laces and a cover, uh, or, you know, I'm a huge fan of BOA and we actually use it in some of our bag product line, but the BOAs on the side of the shoes are not, that's not where you want to put a, a, a circle, a disc, right? It's, it's, it's not the kind of thing you want to stick in the wind. And so I know there's a couple of brands out there um, that have like the single BOA on the heel kind of integrated into a little bit of like an arrow sort of a thing. Mm-hmm. Um, like Bond Trigger is one I can think of. I know D God, when I was racing 25 years ago, Diodora had a, a sort of similar thing. that was quite clever. Um, yeah. Those, those can be another couple of Watts. So yeah, the right shoes and socks can probably be, five, six, maybe seven Watts. Um, and so I would say, you know, depending for short course stuff in triathlon, it's the, the time isn't worth it, but for like Ironman distance, a hundred percent, I would pick, uh, I would pick a lace up shoe, uh, and take, you know, 15 seconds to, uh, to, to tie it. Um, or, or with a cover, you know, something like that, uh, or put the socks on that time spent is going to be, more than made up uh, over the length of the event uh, if you've got the yeah. right shoe and the right sock so can, can you mention the socks again the brands of the of the aero socks that you that you know of oh um i know castelli's got a really good one uh there's the aero coach brand i think they're made by no pins uh out of the uk um is it hub the huub uh mm-hmm. brand that i can't remember Kim, uh, there's so many people kind of uh, collaborating with so many. I mean, it's a really exciting time for that. Uh, but I think any of those, if, if you search, uh, you know, aerodynamic cycling sock, uh, you'll find it. But I know off the top of my, I think Defeat might might have launched one somewhat recently. Um, but yeah, typically when you see them, it's that the cuff is a is not a knit uh, like a traditional sock knit, but it's like a like a lycra. And it's got like a vertical ribbing um, in it, and so the, mm. the it, it's sort of a double effect. It's a compressive fabric, so it's kind of tightening and it's sort of shrinking. As we like to say, shrinking the a. It's re, it's removing some frontal area by compressing your leg a little bit smaller. Um, but then it's got these ribs in it that can act as trip strips, a little bit like the dimples, uh, you know, on the, the zip wheel um, to trip the air into remaining. A little bit more attached and leaving a little bit less of a pressure wake uh, behind it. So you're, uh, you know, all said and done, you're kind of lowering the CD and the A a little bit uh, with that that design. And then the same thing with the shoes. You know, if the shoes you just want to be as as small and as smooth as possible, um, with the least amount of I, I like to call them the sticky outy bits, uh, which is comes from a good friend in, in Formula One racing <laughs> <laughs> describing <laughs> F1 cars, but. Uh, you know, if, if you can avoid the sticky outy bits um, in anything and everything, you're you're generally going to be on a good track. And would shoe covers be beneficial even if you have sort of chosen the ideal pair of shoes, or or is it just mainly to get get around some problems with the shoes that have those sticky outy bits? Uh, the the shoe covers, uh, I would say, the right shoe cover with no wrinkles is going to be faster than even the fast shoe and the fast sock. Typically, um, you know, a lot of the fastest shoe covers, uh, out there do integrate the sort of ribbed lycra thing in the, the ankle that we see in the sock, uh, the fast sock. Um, but I've also seen people buy the shoe cover that maybe doesn't fit quite as well, or maybe it's just a touch big, um, and you end up with wrinkles in it and, and that can completely undo the advantage. Uh, you know, wr- wrinkles are probably one of the biggest, um, the biggest arrow offenders left for us to deal with in these sports. Um, that you know we've been able to so optimize so many things, uh, and and a couple of wrinkles can just kill you, especially if they're in the wrong spot. Um, so yeah, I you know to put it in perspective, I mean some of some of my teams that I work with, a sky is a good example. Uh, I mean they they like they'll take a tailor to the tour. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, and, and they will literally be tailoring because you're, you know, your body isn't the same every day and certainly isn't the same over three weeks. Um, and that they will actually be tailoring these things sort of live, uh, through the event to, to get some of the, the these wrinkles out, uh, because they can be so costly. Wow. 
And uh, hydration setup, uh, what would be, and from in, in here we can talk about from the perspective of a long distance triathlon, so you need to be carrying a certain amount of, of fluid, what would be the good ways and not so good ways to, to set up your hydration? So there's some dependency uh, of bike and position in terms of like, say, a rear hydration carrier, you know, is, is higher, better than lower. I've, I've seen, I would say, somewhat consistently lower tends to be a little bit better, but then I've also seen that flipped on its head and, and higher be better for certain athletes. Um, you know, anything you can do to get rid of round water bottles in the airflow uh, really needs to be addressed. You know, like the, the BTA, the, the between the arm um, round bottle that can work pretty well. Um, but really a round bottle anywhere else is just trouble. And so, you know, any sort of the sculpted rear hydration carriers, um, you know, the, uh, I, I think my, in its simplest form, my long course, um, recommendation would be to look at Jan <laughs> for Dano and do what he's doing. Cause I think he's put more time, effort, energy, um, and, and, uh, res- human resources into optimizing that setup than probably any triathlete ever. Uh, you know, the, the sort of arrow nose cone is, is super fast. The thing he's doing with his, uh, his bars, um, is amazing. And then, you know, if you're going to, if you're going to have bottles on the bike, they need to be arrow bottles, um, for sure. And then there's a, I know a bunch of companies out there making, um, you know, special like 3d printed bottle cages or little storage devices that will integrate into different frames to kind of seal up some of those gaps. Um, that stuff is generally well worth it. Uh, on so I'm looking, I'm, I'm looking at Jan right now, and uh, I'm very surprised, but to see that he actually has an arrow bottle on uh, on on the on the bike frame, so he doesn't just go with the the VTA and the behind the saddle, but he he has one uh, on on the on, on the actual frame. Uh, but uh, I assume that it's an arrow bottle. I can't quite see from this photo, yeah. but uh, that's that's okay then if if it's an arrow bottle. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, and, and it's frame dependent, uh, and, and really needs to be tested, uh, unless you see someone like him doing it. But, uh, yeah, there, there are certain combinations of bottle, bottle cage, um, out there. And, and Jan is on, I mean, he's really doing it right where you can actually make the frame more aerodynamic with the bottle than without. Um, you know, I, I know we've, I, I've actually, had athletes at like Kona uh, run empty arrow bottles on uh, just, just because of the arrow advantage of it. Uh, you know, even if you know, they say, well, I'm, I'm never going to drink from it. Well, fine. We'll, we'll put your spares in it or, you know, well, <laughs> well yeah. you can run it empty. Um, but you think of the, the right bottle in the right cage that fits tightly in the frame and smoothly uh, really just adds to the surface area of, of the frame and reduces the, uh, the amount of leading and trailing edges that the air has to clear its way off of and back onto. Uh, so yeah, something like, like looking at what Jan's doing, you can see we're really minimizing the amount of leading edge, uh, and the amount of trailing edge, uh, of, of the tubes of the frame to just try to keep as smooth as possible flow going around the bike rather than kind of through it and, and all over it. Yeah, that's probably why he has it uh, in the photo that I'm looking at. He has the the bottle right down at the bottom of the of the bottom tube, so it sort of it does that effect exactly. It removes some leading and trailing edges because it sort of melts into uh, in into the seat post or or the the uh, the, the tube that goes to the saddle post. Now I'm blanking right. myself on uh, bike <laughs> geometry. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway, he removes uh, removes some leading uh, trailing trailing edges specifically. Yeah. And do you know? Speaking of Jan, do you know uh, if uh, like what sort of aero testing he he does? If it, have you an idea? Does he go to the wind wind tunnel, or is it chunk testing, or what's sort of a little of everything? I think um, I, I know he does a ton of field testing. Uh, you know, he's someone that I, I've worked off and on with for a number of years, and he's I, I love Jan because he never stops thinking. Right? He's he's the guy that will see somebody do something uh, or have something and guaranteed it, you know, there's an email Monday morning. Hey, was it a race? (laughs) I took this picture. What's going on here? I mean, he's just constantly uh, trying to find that next thing, 
you know, to make sure he doesn't, uh, doesn't lose it. I know uh, a good bit of, of field testing, uh, Chung testing. He's done quite a bit of velodrome testing, um, but it's essentially using Chung methodology. And then I do know with, uh, with zip, he has been in the wind tunnel, uh, a, a number of times, both for position development and for some product development. You know, they, they worked quite closely on that, uh, the arrow extensions that he won Kona with last year, uh, yeah. that are really, really quite beautiful, uh, when, when you look at them up close. Hmm. So yeah, he's, he's optimizing. I, I think Jan is never not optimizing. <laughs> yeah. And it shows. And what about, what about nutrition then? Uh, so uh, something that is a bit problematic is that, uh, and especially if we're talking about half and full, this is triathlons where you need to have quite a lot of nutrition. Uh, if you put gels, for example, or bars in your back pockets on the suit, then you start to get those wrinkles and uh, mm-hmm. sticky out a bit uh, on yeah. your suit, on your maybe perfectly flat back, and you ruin everything. Right. But then you have a limited number of places to put nutrition. What would you, be your recommendation for that? Yeah, I, I'm a huge proponent of the uh, bento box, for lack of a better word. You know, the mm. uh, you know we, we call ours the speed capsule, I think. I, I think everybody tries to find a, a clever word for, but that, uh, that behind the stem um, sort of space, you know, that uh, we, we've known, uh, Mark Cody had specialized, he did his, his uh, like thesis on uh, filling in that area behind the stem 15 years ago, and it just took the industry forever to to do it. Um, but you putting a aero bag behind the stem there can actually improve the aerodynamics of the bike, and it can also give you a couple hundred cc's of storage space um, that's really readily accessible. Uh, you know, and so I, I would say, you know, get one of those. Um, you, you know, if you need. To hold more, then maybe get a little bit bigger one. Uh, you know, we we make one. Uh, Dark Speedworks makes one. I mean, there's a ton of companies make them. Bikes like you know, Jan's Canyon comes with its own special kind of plastic and rubber uh, version of one. And you're really better off uh, or best off to keep your nutrition in something like that. And I would say if if you need more nutrition, then try to find a version of that that's a little bit bigger or a little bit longer. Um, cause you think of length in a top tube bag like that, uh, is, is adding no frontal area, right? I mean, it's adding no a to your CDA. Uh, it mm. may actually be helping on the CD because it's cleaning up some of the dirty air behind the stem. Um, and it's also just such a readily easily accessed, uh, place on the bike that you're, you know, when you do break position, you're breaking it, uh, for a shorter period of time and in a less extreme way than, you know, if you're trying to get to your, you know, something behind the seat or something that's in pockets or, or you know, something where the rider's having to really kind of twist and contort or maybe come out of the arrow bars altogether. Um, you know, you're, so I mean, there's really, it's kind of a multifactorial benefit to, to a bag like that. Um, yeah. the, the last thing I would say is I've, I've seen, and I've, I've done with riders where, you know, we might, um, say do a nose cone hydration like Jan is using and then put a water bottle between the arms, like a BTA setup. Um, but where maybe you cut into that bottle. Um, so it's accessible from the top and you can stick gels or something, uh, you know, in it that way. Right. So it's, mm, yep. uh, you're kind of using a water bottle more as a, as a storage device, uh, it, it, that can be quite arrow. And I would say that the only real downside to that, uh, from a rider perspective is it can be noisy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know stuff rattling around in there yeah well something that i've done in races is to just stick gels down the front of my tri, uh, tri suit and uh, yeah. hopefully that that would be better than at least sticking them in at at the back and uh, usually they they stay reasonably well in place around the chest and i can just pick them up whenever but i do have sometimes i've experienced that they kind of fall down and <laughs> get very difficult <laughs> to access so there's that downside of it yeah yeah i think you know it there's different things that can work for really everybody. But I, I think from a attacking the problem, the easiest way to think of it is, you know, yeah, where, where's it going to not add frontal area, not cause wrinkles. Um, and, and the big one also just being, where can I access it in a way that I'm breaking position the least? I think that's yeah. one of the, the elements that I know we work with athletes a lot on that athletes don't otherwise, you know, because you don't feel yourself slow down when you break position. Um, 
but of course, you know, if, if I have you instrumented, um, we, we can see it in real time in the data <laughs> and, and, it can, and you can slow yourself down by quite a bit. And so the, the double cost of that is, you know, maybe it's 30 seconds of kind of slowing down, riding awkwardly, getting yourself situated. Well, now you get back into position and you actually have to accelerate back to your pace. Um, and so you've, you've both lost, you've lost the time of being out of position for whatever that, that amount of time is. But then you've also lost from an energy side of the equation. You've lost that effort of having to accelerate yourself back to, uh, you know, to your race speed. Um, and so really it can hit you in a couple of ways. And you, you know, you look at, if I take 12, 30 second feeding, uh, position breaks out of an Ironman, I mean, I, you know, that can be three, four minutes. Um, which is a lot, right? Yeah. And a lot of times we, we can solve that relatively easily with, uh, yeah, something like the, the Bento or the, the BTA uh, feed. Makes sense. And uh, let's tackle these last couple of points in one. So first, uh, just drivetrain friction improving devices like ceramic bearings and uh, oversized pulleys that you mentioned earlier, uh, but also uh, the one by uh, sort of setup for the chain ring. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on those uh, pieces of equipment? So, you know, ceramic, I actually get credit or have gotten credit for putting, we put the first ceramic bearings ever in a wheel set back in 2000. Um, you know, at the top level, there you absolutely need to do it. Uh, you know, the ceramic wheel set upgrade is about 0.8 watts to a watt, uh, bottom brackets, a couple tenths of a watt up to maybe half, uh, and the oversized pulleys can be, call it two watts. Uh, so yeah, if you're, if you're Jan, you, you know, or Jordan Rapp or somebody hundred percent, you need them. Um, you know, I, from a cost benefit perspective, I would do those after you do everything else just cause it's expensive. You know, it's, it's a lot of dollars per watt saved. <laughs> right. Mm. I mean, you might be, uh, you know, three to $500 per watt saved with ceramic bearings where, uh, you know, something like a, a, a really perfectly fitting, uh, skin suit or body suit might buy you, you know, might be talking 20 to $30 per watt saved, uh, or helmet. It can oftentimes be in the same, that same scale, you know, 20 bucks a watt. I mean, that's it, very cost effective savings. Um, so, you know, those are huge. Chain friction is the biggest part of your drivetrain um, friction. So, you know, a hot melt wax uh, on your chain is huge. You know, if you want to buy uh, a pre-prepped chain, those are super fast as well. Um, they just get expensive after a while. But yeah, if you, you know, a couple of, couple of old water bottles and some acetone and an old crock pot and some uh, either paraffin wax, and stuff that you homebrew off the internet or buying something like a molten speed wax. I mean, you, you can take a, you can take a bicycle chain from call it a, a seven to 10 Watts of loss at, at 300 Watts. And you can drop that to about four Watts of loss. Uh, and you can do it quite, quite inexpensively. Um, you know, on a, uh, I think we did the math on that once. And it was, you know, once you, if you amortize the cost of a crock pot over a season uh, you know, the, the slow cooker thing, it, I mean, you're saving it at something like, you know, seven bucks a watt, six bucks a watt. It's pretty effective. <laughs> wow. um, yeah. So, you know, that's the kind of stuff, yeah, 100% need to, to be looking into uh, and doing. And then, of course, like we talked earlier with, uh, with you know, tire pressures are kind of in that same scale. You know, getting that right can be, uh, you know, two to six watts, call it, um, especially if you've been running too high, right? You can actually bring that back. So, when it comes to component specific things, you know, one by has the effect of lowering the A and the CDA slightly. Um, so there is a slight arrow advantage to it. Um, but there can then also be a slight arrow disadvantage depending on what derailleur and cassette you're running that, you know, if you have that cassette with a 36 tooth <laughs> cog in the back and the long cage derailleur to match it, then you've actually gained back more A than you've given up when you gave up the front derailleur, right? And the, uh, the second chain ring. The other thing to think about is, uh, that, that I'm a, I guess a big kind of a loud mouth on is that 
the smaller cogs in the rear run at higher frictions. Um, and so, you know, there's not much worse thing you can do than run a 10 tooth cog in the back. I mean, it's, it's 30, 40% more frictional losses than like a 12 tooth cog. Uh, and, and so depending on the course and what you're doing, um, one by can make a lot of sense is if you're not using like that 10 and 11 tooth cog. Um, and if you're able to do it in a way where you can run a slightly bigger chain ring, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a big fan of going bigger ring, bigger, uh, bigger cassette, uh, because we just see it run at lower friction rates. Right. So, uh, yeah, I mean, so you can have the chain on, a uh, on, on one of the cogs on the cassette with, uh, with more teeth, so less friction. It, Exactly. Exactly. And so that, that's more of the, I think for me, the thing to think about one buy in, um, is, you know, where on this course, where we really need to be running and can we get away with a little bit bigger chain ring and a little bit bigger cog? Um, you know, and if you end up using that 10 tooth cog on a, uh, you know, cause you're getting spun out on some descent in the middle of the race, that's not a big deal. Um, but if you're, you know, you're needing that 10 and 11 tooth cog for 70% of the race, you know, uh, on the flat part of the course, like in Ironman, Florida, um, then you need to make a change because, <laughs> because you're, you know, running, I mean, just for I'm kind of pulling numbers from the air, but you know, that, that 10 tooth, uh, compared to like a 13 or a 14 tooth, uh, cog, it's probably costing you at least, uh, that ceramic pulley upgrade worth of Watts just by All running right. on that one versus yeah. the other. Yeah. So, you know, but kind of putting it back into that mentally accessible, <laughs> <laughs> cost benefit yeah. um yeah something that simple can cost you that much that quickly yeah and uh, are there any any things that we missed that uh, we should mention still on uh, any of these topics whether it's aerodynamics or friction or just general things that you can do to get faster gain some speed uh, honestly like probably the biggest one that i think gets missed um at all levels, including the pros, uh, in triathlon is bike cleanliness. Uh, a, a cleaner bike is faster for a bunch of reasons. Um, but it's also less likely to, to, you know, have a mechanical or, or to hide a, a, f- a future mechanical, um, you know, just cleaning your drivetrain, uh, well and lubricating it can save you a couple of Watts. Uh, so, you know, I, I cannot tell you how many, you know, even like Ironman Konas that I've been to where, you know, you see the bike and it's, it's a $20,000 bike with every upgrade and ceramic and, you know, everything. And the thing has clearly not been washed and relubed in, in two months. <laughs> right. And, mm. and the way to think of that is that, you know, when that, that bike is perfectly the, the numbers we like to quote are for perfectly new equipment that generally we're unboxing and we're installing and running in a lab. Every little bit of riding outdoors that you're doing is getting, and, and even indoors stuff is accumulating now in the pins of the chain. It's getting into the bearings. You know, it, it could be salt from your sweat. It could be dirt. It could be, um, you know, little, little dirt, uh, and, and, uh, mineral per, uh, particulates that are in like a puddle that you run through that get splashed up onto the bottom bracket and then kind of slowly find their way into the seals. Um, you know, one of the things that makes some of this stuff so fast is that, uh, like the ceramic bearings, uh, is that the seal pressures are essentially zero, right? I mean, you have a, you have a seal, but it's not contacting in a way that's taking watts up. Well, that also then leaves it vulnerable to every puddle that you ride through on every ride. Um, right. Or every, every bit of dust in the wind that blows against you when you're riding. And so, you know, if I take this perfectly tuned bike in the lab and, you know, I say, Oh, we've got it. It, it's, it's got five Watts of, uh, you know, of, of there's six Watts of chain frictional loss in this gear. And, you know, we're calling it a 1% drivetrain loss, uh, or one and a half is pretty good. Um, and then we ride that bike for a month and we bring it back in and we test it again. I mean, it, we easily see that, that we're now at two and a half, maybe three watt or 3% uh, drivetrain loss. So just cleaning the thing regularly will make it last longer, but also make it run a lot smoother um, and faster. And then the other thing that you're picking up there that I see a lot of it, at triathlons in particular um, are those sort of um, 
potential problems, maintenance issues that are hidden under like dirt or sweat or grime. We see this with a lot of bikes that people are riding on the trainer. You know, Zwift is is so awesome, but it is an absolute destroyer of bicycles, <laughs> right? Because your sweat uh, contains not just salt, but uh, trace amounts of ammonia and some other pretty toxic stuff. And ammonia will etch and uh, eat at aluminum. And so it's it's pretty interesting. You know, you, you can take a bike that looks like it's been ridden on the trainer, but more or less okay. And if you really, you know, you take the bar tape off and you start to strip it down, um, you you know, I found, I, I've seen handlebars that you can literally poke a screwdriver right through the aluminum because it's so etched from uh, from sweat from indoor. So, you know, that that would be the other, I would say, big piece to just stay on top of is, you know, get, get the thing, especially if you're indoors, you should be taking it out and probably rinsing it down once a week. You know, we, we actually make a special wipe product to wipe it down while it's on the trainer to try to neutralize some of those chemicals. Um, but even with that, you should be taking it out and giving it a good a good wash down with some frequency. Yeah, I'm taking notes here. This is uh, definitely a life to me. <laughs> <laughs> all right, uh, thank thank you so much for for all of this information. We have yeah, uh, the final the final segment of the interview left to go, which is the rapid fire questions, which. Oh, okay. uh, are just uh, one sentence one or less to answer these. And the first oh. one is, what's your favorite book, blog, or resource related to endurance sports? Oh, gosh. I I don't have one. Uh, I, I read a lot of um, economics and math and physics, and I don't have a – yeah, uh, I would say no answer. Well, I, I like all of those topics. What, what's your favorite <laughs> book, blog, or resource on any of those? <laughs> oh, gosh. There's, uh, Marginal Revolution is a great economics blog, uh, sort of an aggregator of, of research. Fascinating. Uh, Freakonomics, uh, books podcast, big fan. Um, and I would say Radio Lab would be another one uh, podcast that uh, I love that covers what's a lot of those topics. Perfect. And what's your favorite piece of gear or equipment? Oh, I I bought myself a 1990 Eddie Merckx uh, MX Leader. Totally ridiculous bike. Don't need it. Uh, it weighs 26 pounds, but it has Delta brakes on it. Uh, and it's in the Multini paint job. It's my all-time favorite bicycle, um, despite the fact that it's it's the antithesis of everything that I preach. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it is very cool. I, I have to give you that. <laughs> and finally, what's a personal habit that's helped you achieve success? Oh, uh, no television. I quit television uh, 12 years, 10, 12 years ago. And life-changing. Life, it's like you find two extra hours in every day to do something uh, productive and meaningful. Great. And finally, tell the listeners where they can uh, find you, find Silka, and uh, everything that uh, you're doing. Keep uh, keep up to date on that. Oh, awesome. Uh, you can find Silka, Silka is at uh, silka.cc uh, online. And our podcast is the Marginal Gains Podcast, uh, which can be found at marginalgainspodcast.cc. Great. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you, Josh, and uh, have a nice rest of your day. You as well. Thanks so much. I hope that you enjoyed that interview. You can find the show notes on scientifictriathlon.com. And in the show notes, I will link to all the things mentioned, including the tire pressure calculator that uh, I have used and uh, really like, which is a very detailed, by far the most detailed tire pressure calculator I've seen online. And it is free to use. You can use the premium version by just adding your email. So a highly recommended resource that I now have in my favorites tab in my browser. On Thursday, we have another Q&A episode coming your way. And then on Monday, I interview one of the heavy hitters in endurance sports nutrition science, Professor Louise Burke from the Australian Institute of Sport, where we discuss the science of high-carb diets, low-carb diets, periodized carbohydrate diets, and their respective impacts on endurance performance. So stay tuned for that. And uh, finally, a final call to action. This is the last week that the Beginner Ironman training plan is on its uh, launch discount period. So you can still get it for 60% off until the 31st of May, which is at the very end of this week. 
uh, if you're listening as this episode goes out. So go to scientifictriathlon.com and read more about the plan. Uh, it's uh, a long one. It's 26 weeks long, in fact, and uh, it's designed to take you to through your first Ironman if you have never done one before. Or perhaps you might have done a few, but you are uh, a back-of-the-pack athlete, so to say, then this plan will be uh, a great fit for you. Big thanks to our sponsors, Precision Hydration, that you can find on precisionhydration.com. Go and take their free online sweat test to get an individual individualized hydration strategy for you. And check out their electrolytes that you can get for 15% off with the promo code thattriathlonshow15. And thank you to Roka that you can find on roka.com uh, or go directly to roka.com forward slash TTS to get your 20% discount valid for your entire order of wetsuits, tri suits, swim skins, goggles, and high performance eyewear, and prescription glasses and sunglasses. And in particular, go and read more about the new flagship wetsuit model, the Maverick X2. Thank you, as always, for listening. Keep training smart and keep loving triathlons.